Okay, welcome to Word Without Walls. Welcome to the <coughs> Tuesday night sunlight service. This is Judgment Day Part 4. And when I started this uh, sermon series, I wasn't 100% sure that it was going to uh, be this long of a series. I kind of thought I was just going to kind of hit a few things. But as God's been showing me things, uh, I've been you know trying to show you these things. And and it, it took me until part four to really get into what the judgment of God means for us now, today. Uh, we talked about how Jesus is the one who was judged, and that judgment day in its eternality was the cross. And, and that judgment is not God killing his son, so he doesn't have to kill humanity. Because as we saw in Hebrews, first it is appointed unto men once to die, then the judgment. So if you die first and then get the judgment, death can't very well be the judgment. So what we saw was that after Jesus died, both for us and as us, then God judged him righteously and raised him back to life. And that's what the judgment of God is. It's him giving us his spirit, giving us his son, giving us his kingdom, giving us his life. That is what the judgment of God is. It's not an angry God killing you because you deserve it because of your sin. It's a loving Heavenly Father accepting the sacrifice of His Son and then judging Him righteous and giving Him resurrection life. And again, since Jesus had drawn us into Himself, anything that applied to Jesus applies to us, so we were given that same judgment. And now because we have been given that judgment, because we have His Spirit, because we have His life, because He lives inside of us, now it, 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 it brings our judgment into a different, uh, kind of a, a different dimension. And, and my thought for today is, uh, I hear what I hear about Christians is, you're not supposed to judge me, you're a Christian. And I think that people get that from Matthew chapter 7, verse 1 and 2, where Jesus says, Judge not that ye be not judged. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. So, a couple of things here right off the bat. First of all, you always have to understand who Jesus was talking to and, and what Jesus was talking about. Everything Jesus said doesn't directly apply to us. A lot of what he said applies to Jews who were under the law because that was his audience at the time. And, and, and another thing that you see here is that Jesus wasn't saying, don't judge. He was, he, he was, he was counseling us. He was warning us. He was showing us that under that economy, under the Old Covenant, whatever you do, that's how you're rewarded. Judge not so that you don't be judged. He wasn't saying don't judge or else. He was saying for what judgment you judge, you shall be judged. He was saying what you sow is what you will reap. He was showing us something. He wasn't giving us a hard and fast rule. And then I, I kind of like it in the Message Bible, and, and, and this, is, this is really kind of appropriate how the, the author of the Message Bible puts it, in Matthew 7, verse 1, it says, Don't pick on people, jump on their failures, criticize their faults. Unless, of course, you want the same treatment. That critical spirit has a way of boomeranging. And I think that's the, the, the biggest misconception people have about judging or judgment is we always put it into a negative connotation. We always think, if you're judging me, that means you're criticizing me, that means you're jumping on me, that means you're, you're, you're judging me negatively. But what I saw when I did a word study is the word judge here in Matthew chapter 7 verse 1. It's number 2919 in Strong's Greek Concordance. And the word judge means to distinguish or decide. The word judge means think. So Jesus was not saying don't think. He was saying be careful how you think. Because whatever you believe, that's what's going to manifest. Whatever you magnify, that's what's going to manifest. Whatever you behold, that's what you're going to become. He wasn't saying, don't judge, because we make judgments all the time about everything. He was just simply saying, be careful how you judge. And the word judgment there, in, uh, in verse 2, the word judgment is number 2917 in Strong's Creek Concordance. And the word judgment means a decision for or against. Judgment is not always against you. The righteous judgment of God was for you. It was in your favor. It gave you something that you didn't have before. It gave you life and that more abundantly. Which I hope we've seen in, in, in the first you know three weeks of this series. Is that God's judgment was not a bad thing. God's judgment was not a hard thing. God's judgment was not a mean thing. God's judgment was a good thing. It was for us. It was Him giving us something. It was Him giving us, again, His Spirit, His life, His kingdom. It was the Father judging the Son. 
and judging him righteously, judging him accordingly to, to, to uh, it was the father judging the son according to his love for the son. So again, you know, people always say, oh, Christians are so judgmental. Everybody's judgmental. The problem is not judging, the problem is how you judge. And that's really what we're going to look at tonight. It's not about don't judge anything ever. Because you're supposed to judge things. And we're going to look at that in the word of Paul later on. The, the issue here is not judge or don't judge. The issue here is how are we judging? How are we distinguishing things? How are we deciding things? How are we thinking about things? And remember that word think, because again, that's going to tie in later on. But I first wanted to read my first passage tonight is Luke chapter 6. And I'm going to read verses 27 to about 38. And this is when, uh, when we get down to the bottom of it, he's going to say the same, pretty much the same thing, but it really kind of gives it a new light. It really kind of gives us some context so we can see what Jesus is talking about. And of course, you know, through it all, whatever Jesus said, what he was talking about was himself, the cross, and love. So that's what we're going to see here when we read what Jesus said in, in Luke chapter 6. So starting with verse 27 in the King James Bible, Jesus, the words of Jesus read like this. But I say unto you which hear, love your enemies, do good to them which hate you. As simply as I can make it, that's judging righteously. Okay? That's judging or distinguishing or deciding or thinking about things correctly. It's not whatever you do to me, I'm going to do to you. It's not an eye for an eye. It's not I'll scratch your back if you scratch mine. It's love your enemies and do good to them which hate you. It's here's what judgment is, love. That's how we judge. That's how we're supposed to judge everything. That's as simply as I can make it. But he goes on and he says, Bless them that curse you and pray for them which despitefully use you. And unto him that smiteth thee on the one cheek also offer the other. And him that taketh away thy cloak, forbid not to take thy coat also. So now he's taking an eye for an eye, and he's saying, if someone slaps you, I want you to give him the other one. He's saying, don't fight back against people. He's saying, don't try to overcome good with evil, or don't over try to come evil with evil, because that's just going to produce more evil, but overcome evil with good, the Bible says in another place. So he's saying, guys, there's a more excellent way, and that excellent way is love. And really what we need to start to understand is that if somebody slaps you on the cheek, their problem probably really isn't with you. Their problem is probably really with themselves. Because you can't give what you don't have, and you can only give what you do have. So if somebody gives you anger, it's because they have anger. If somebody gives you meanness or bitterness or, or whatever it is, or hurt, that's because that's what they have. And if you respond in kind, all you're doing is, is, is really what you're doing is what the Message Bible said. And you're piling on, and, and you're criticizing them, and you're jumping on them, and, and you're not helping anybody. And now you, you really look kind of lowered yourself to that same level, instead of judging with righteous judgment. Instead of, again, distinguishing, or deciding, or thinking about a decision for that person, instead of a decision against that person. Because, you know, when a snowball starts to roll, it can pick up steam really easily. Somebody's mean to you, and you're mean back, and then you're mean to somebody else, and it just grows and grows and grows. Or, you can give them the other cheek. You can say, brother, I know you're hurting. Is there anything I can do to help? You can begin to judge righteously. You can begin to take what you have and give it to them, rather than taking what they have and then boomeranging it back to them. So he goes on in verse 30 and says, Give to every man that asketh of thee. And of him that taketh away thy goods, ask them not again. So he's speaking about love, he's speaking about generosity, he's speaking about giving, which is what love is. You know, John 3.16, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. You know, I've heard it said many times, you can give without loving, but you cannot love without giving. Because that's what love is, it's giving, it's it's compassion, it's charity, it's giving somebody what you have rather than just returning to them what they've given you, which, which again, if somebody gives you something, that's because that's what they have. So they don't need what they gave you, they need what you have. And what we have because of the Holy Spirit, or rather what we know we have because of the Holy Spirit, is love. So that's what we can always give. That's why we can go back again to the beginning where it says, love your enemies, do good to them which hate you. You can't love your enemies unless you have love, unless you know you're loved. And when you know that daddy loves you, and when that's where your love comes from, it doesn't matter what somebody does to you. 
then you can love those that hate you because it doesn't matter that they hate you. Because you're not focused on what you're getting from them. You're focused on what you've already received from the Father. And then, you know, remember, I use this analogy all the time. If we are the spout where the glory comes out, we don't have to produce any love. We just have to receive it from Daddy and then let it flow out of us naturally. So he goes on and says, uh, in verse 31, Jesus says, And as ye would that men should do to you, do ye also to them likewise. And again, you know, this is kind of the gold rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. But, but really, Jesus takes it even further than that in another place when he gives the new commandment. Because, uh, again, when, when we see this, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, Jesus says, and I believe Paul says too, that that fulfills the law. But we're not under the law. We're under grace. So we're not doing something out of a selfish motivation. I'm not loving you so that you'll love me. I'm loving you because Daddy loves me. I'm loving you because that's what I have, and what I have is what I can give. So, again, you know, I, I, I understand Jesus saying, you know, the, a, a practical way to do this is to think about what I would like done to me and then do it to you. But, but really, an even better form of love, a more excellent way is, is me looking at you and judging, seeing what you need, and then giving that to you. Because love comes in all kinds of forms. He says in verse 32, For if ye love them which love you, what thank have you? For sinners also love those that love them. And again, this is, you know, that, that kind of selfish mindset where, where of course you like the people who love you. Everybody does that. That's no big deal. If somebody's nice to you, it's easy to be nice to them. But it's those people that are mean to you, those people that need somebody, desperately need somebody to be nice to them. That's where the love of God comes in. That's where, I don't care if you're mean to me or if you're nice to me because I'm going to love you anyway. And that's, again, those are those, uh, those hot coals that we talk about that we heap on our, uh, on our quote-unquote enemies' heads. And it's not hot coals to burn them and to hurt them, but it's the hot coals of the fire of the love that is God that will melt their heart. And then we see that, that uh, I believe it was, uh, I saw this quote not too long ago, I think it was Abraham Lincoln who said, I destroy my enemies by making them friends. And again, that's what those hot coals do. They melt the hearts of your enemies. And, and, and listen, if you're loving somebody, it's going to be hard for them to be mean to you. It just is. Because when you're loving somebody, you're giving them something that they need. You're giving them something that they desire. You're giving them something that they, that, that they don't already have. And then once they start to have it, then they can start to give it. And, and again, that's, that's the, the, the kind of the positive aspect of that snowball rolling downhill. If I stop the, the, the anger train, so to speak, and, and, and I bring in the love train, and then that starts to snowball, that starts to build, that starts to grow, really like a Holy Ghost wildfire that, that can't be quenched. So he says, uh, And if ye do good to them which do good to you, what thank have you? For sinners also do even the same. And if ye lend to them of whom ye hope to receive, what thank have you? For sinners also lend to sinners to receive as much again. So he's talking about this whole idea of, I'll scratch your back if you scratch mine. And he says, what good is that? He says, that's not helping anybody. Because if, 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 if you love somebody because they love you, then really you already have your reward. What's anybody getting out of that? But if you love somebody who doesn't love you, now you've changed something. Now you've introduced something. Now you've shown somebody something better, something that they hoped for, something that they wished for, something that they longed for. And now you've given it to them, and now they don't have to hope for it anymore. Which is very, very important, because the Bible says in another place that hope deferred makes the heart sick. If you want something so bad, but you never get it. If you try to get something so hard, but there's always one thing you lack. If you're trying to grab that carrot on the stick, but the carrot keeps moving further and further away, eventually you're probably just going to give up. And you're going to say, well, I can't have that, so I'll just stick with what I have. I can't have love? Fine, then I'll just keep being mean to everybody. And I know that's not your conscious mindset, but, but that's what so, so many times happens. But instead, if we can come in and we can introduce something better, and, and really in that way introduce God, the true God, the living God, the God who is love, if we can introduce Him to people, not by saying you have to read the Bible, not by saying Jesus saves or else, not even by being religious at all, but just simply by saying, it's okay, I love you. Don't worry about being mean to me. I'm not going to get you back for it. I'm not going to hold it in. I'm not going to boomerang it back at you. I'm going to love you because Daddy loves me. And then, once again, you know, once you show somebody a more excellent way, once you show them what they've been looking for, then now it's not 
deferred anymore. Now it's not making them sick anymore. Now it's not jumping through hoops to get it anymore. Now it's Jesus standing at the door and knocking. And, and of course you're going to open that door. Of course you're going to let him in because you've seen how good he is. It's the goodness of God that leads men to repentance. Not the scariness of God. Not, not the punishment of God. Not the religion of God. It's the goodness of God that draws men to repentance. So in verse 35 of Luke 6, Jesus says, But love ye your enemies, and do good, and lend, hoping for nothing again. And your reward shall be great, and ye shall be the children of the highest. For he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. Think about that. Daddy is kind to the unthankful and to the evil. Daddy doesn't care what you do. Daddy loves you. And when you know that daddy loves you, you'll do different things. Because what you do flows from what you believe. If you don't think daddy loves you, what you do is trying to get that love. But, but again, you're looking for love in all the wrong places. You're trying to get something that you, you're trying to earn something that you can't earn. You can't earn a gift. In another place in the Bible, it talks about how, you know, it rains on the just and the unjust alike. Daddy's not separating between, I love you, I don't love you, you're okay because you are good today. No, God's love is forever for everyone. And when we understand that, when we understand that that's how he loves us, then we can love each other in that same fashion, which is what Jesus said in the New Commandment. He didn't say, scratch my back and I'll scratch yours. He said, love one another as I have loved you. And that's the key. It's all about God loving me and then that love bursting out of me, that love overflowing out of me, that love filling me up to overflowing so that I don't even have to think about loving or think about who I'm loving because I'm so focused on the love that Daddy has for me that it just comes out naturally. And again, that's what it means to be a lighthouse. A lighthouse doesn't choose where it shines. A lighthouse shines because that's what it is, because there's a light shining inside the house. We are the house. He is the light inside of us. We are the light of the world. Wherever we go, we shine simply because, again, simply because of what is shining in us. So it doesn't even have to be a conscious decision. It doesn't even have to be a constant uh, conscious judgment where we say, okay, you're really being mean to me and I don't like that, but I'm going to love you anyway. Instead, it gets to a point where we can say, I'm not worried about what you're doing because I love you. And the more I love you, you know, that the less you're going to do. Because then you're going to have what you're looking for, and you can stop looking for it in all these different ways. So he says in verse 36, Be ye therefore merciful, as your Father also is merciful. So again, where does our mercy come from? It comes from a merciful Father. Where does our forgiveness come from? It comes from a forgiving Father. Everything we have and everything we are comes down from the Father of lights. Because really, when we understand the connection and the unity... When Jesus can, could stand up and say a statement like, I and my Father are one. When he could tell Philip, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. We understand that everything that God is, is everything that we are. Then we understand that his mercy is our mercy. So it doesn't, again, it's not just, uh, it's not just something that he gives us and then we give away. But it's what we have been transformed into by the cross, by the love of the Father, by the judgment that came on Jesus after he had drawn us into himself. And then we get to verse 37, and Jesus says it this way. He says, Judge not, and ye shall not be judged. Condemn not, and ye shall not be condemned. Forgive, and ye shall be forgiven. But again, that's that old covenant economy. That's looking at what I do is what I get. And that's not for us today on this side of the cross. Today on this side of the cross, it's not forgive, and then you will be forgiven. Today on the side of the cross, it's forgive, because you are forgiven. So again, we have to distinguish who Jesus was talking to. We have to distinguish his audience and his intent towards his audience of the Jewish people under the law, the Jewish people in the Old Covenant. So no longer is it forgive and then you'll be forgiven. And, and again, Paul picks up on that in the New Testament when he talks about forgive because you are forgiven. And then look what he says in verse 38. Jesus says, Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, and shaken together, and running over shall men give into your bosom. For with the same measure that ye meet withal, it shall be measured to you again. So again, what he's saying here is he's saying what you have is what you can give. He's saying as you are judged, so judge. 
And again, what's that judgment? It's the righteous judgment of God. It's not, uh, it's, it's not judging things as good and evil, but it's just simply judging life into every situation. So let's look at this. I want to run through this quickly in the message. And then we're going to move on to... Uh, I have one more verse that Jesus said, and then we're going to move on to Paul's words. And then uh, I really think this message is going to... Uh, set up next week's message where we're really going to talk about executing judgment. I know all month I've been talking about how we're going to get into executing judgment, and I think, I really think that that's going to be next week. So, Luke 6, starting with verse 27 in the Message Bible reads, To you who are ready for the truth, I say this, Love your enemies. Let them bring out the best in you, not the worst. When someone gives you a hard time, Respond with the energies of prayer for that person. If someone slaps you in the face, stand there and take it. If someone grabs your shirt, gift wrap your best coat and make a present of it. If someone takes unfair advantage of you, use the occasion to practice the servant life. No more tit-for-tat stuff. Live generously. Here is a simple rule of thumb for behavior. Ask yourself what you want people to do for you, then grab the initiative and do it for them. If you only love the lovable, do you expect a pat on the back? Run-of-the-mill sinners do that. If you only help those who help you, do you expect a medal? Garden variety sinners do that. If you only give for what you hope to get out of it, do you think that's charity? The stingiest of pawnbrokers does that. And again, I like how he used the word charity here because so many times in Paul's writing, rather than saying the word love, he would write the word charity. Which for a long time I didn't understand. Why didn't, why didn't he just write love? And then God showed me that charity is love in action. Charity is putting your money where your mouth is, so to speak. And then I love it what he says here. He says, uh, if you only help those who help you, do you expect a medal? If you only give what you hope for what you hope to get out of it, do you think that's charity? And it's not. Love, we do not love in order to get something. We love because we have something. And again, what we have is love. We love because we are loved. We don't love in order to be loved. If you're trying to love somebody in order to get them to love you, that will never, ever work. Because that's not how love works. Love works like this. Remember what it said about uh, the Father, Father being kind unto the unthankful and to the evil? God doesn't love us in order to get something from us. God loves us because that's who he is. Period. He loves us because he is love. He loves us because we're his. Period. I don't love my son because of what he can do for me. Because, I mean, besides making me smile right now, there's not a lot he can do for me. I love him because he's mine. I love him because I have a father's heart for him. Which, which is the same description, the same picture that Jesus showed us of who God is. He's a father with a heart for his son. So again, our love does not try to get something. Our love comes because we have something. He goes on and says, I tell you, love your enemies. Help and give without expecting a return. You'll never, I promise, you'll never regret it. Live out this God-created identity the way our Father lives towards us. And, and guys, that's the Christian life. Living out our God-created identity the way our Father lives towards us. Jesus said in another place, he said, I live by the Father. So really what he was saying is the same thing that we're saying. Jesus lives. Jesus lived the way he lived because the Father lived in him. We live the way we live because Jesus lives in us and as us and through us. He says, uh, even when we're at our worst, our Father is kind, you be kind. Don't pick on people, jump on their failures, criticize their faults. Unless, of course, you want the same treatment. Don't condemn those who are down. That hardness can boomerang. Be easy on people. Guys, be easy. Just be easy on people. Give people a break. You know how sometimes it feels like it's all you can do to get from the start of the day to the end of the day? Well, maybe you don't feel like that, but a lot of times I feel like that. And guess what? I think a lot of people feel like that. I think, uh, I think most people are doing as much as they can to get through this day. 
and, and we put expectations on them and we put you know unfair criticisms on them and, and, and we don't have compassion for them and we don't have empathy for them or sympathy for them, just, just go easy on people. Just give people a break. Bear one another's burdens instead of loading one another down with more burdens. See what you can do to help instead of always you know, looking at somebody and, and, and doing something that can hurt. He says, uh, give away your life, you'll find life given back. But not merely given back. Give it back with bonus and blessing. <coughs> Giving, not getting, is the way. Generosity begets generosity. So again, remember that snowball? If we stop the snowball of anger and if we start a new snowball of love, that's going to multiply, that's going to roll downhill, that's going to grow and grow. And I like it where, again, uh, Jesus is talking about, you know, forgive and ye shall be forgiven. He says, give and it will be given unto you. And then in the, in the Message Bible, he starts talking about, give away your life. So what we're talking about when we're talking about judging or, or again, distinguishing or deciding or thinking, we're talking about our life. We're not talking about what you're doing, we're talking about, you know, what I'm doing. I'm not judging you, but, but what I need to do is judge myself, which again we're going to look at in a second. I'm going to think differently about myself. I'm going to think differently about how my father thinks about me. And then when I understand that relationship between father and son, when I understand that love between father and son, then that's what I can give away because that's what I have. So we can turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, but I want to read John 7.24. And this is the one that we're really going to pick up next week. Jesus says, Judge not according to appearance, but judge righteous judgment. So if you say, Jesus said don't judge, well, here's Jesus saying, don't judge by appearance, but judge righteous judgment. So now Jesus is saying judge. So again, it's not a hard and fast rule. In Matthew chapter 7, Jesus wasn't saying don't judge. He was saying, be careful how you judge. And that's what he's saying here in John 7, 24. He says, don't judge according to appearance. Don't judge by how things look. Don't judge good and evil, but judge righteous judgment. And again, what is judgment? A decision for or against. So righteous judgment, then, would be a decision for us. It, really, it would be a, a decision of righteousness for us. Because that's what Jesus did. He became sin who knew no sin, that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. That righteous judgment is righteousness. And he's saying, judge with that. He's saying, judge righteously in every situation. And that doesn't mean I'm righteous and you're not, so I'm right and you're wrong. That doesn't mean I'm up on a high horse and I can kick you because you're down. That means if I see you down, I'm going to reach down and I'm going to help you up. That means I'm going to put righteousness into a situation by putting myself into a situation. I'm going to give my life so that God can really, again, fill me up with His life. Jesus said, no greater love has a man than this to lay down his life for his friends. And then he said, you're my friends if you obey my commandments. And then he said, here is my new commandment, love one another as I have loved you. So again, where does this uh, laying down our life come from? Where does this greatest expression of love come from? It comes from the love that he has given us. It all flows from the Father to the Son. And again, understanding that we are the Son. He is the head and we are the body. So let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and then I want to read a passage in 1 Corinthians, and then we're going to close for this week. 2 Corinthians 5, starting with verse 14, tells us, it says, For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. So what is righteous judgment? Jesus died for us, and was judged righteously, and we received that judgment. That's how we judge. That's what Paul said. He said, we thus judge. And then I love it too where he talks about the love of Christ constraining us. If you listen to love, it'll, it, it, it'll bring you where you need to be. It'll stop you from going where you don't need to be. It'll put you right where you want to be. Because again, that's, that's, that's who God is. And, and more importantly, that's who God is in us. Jesus was the Word made flesh. Jesus was love in a body. We are His body. And, and, and He, His love, is in us. And then when the Word is made flesh, when, when we give that charity, when we put love into action, that's when He manifests. That's when He appears. Jesus appears every time you love somebody. Because that's who He is. He's love. 
So, but, but again, where does that come from? It comes from understanding his death, burial, and resurrection. It comes from understanding the judgment of God, raising his son back to life. And not just life, but, but what did it say? Life that is pressed down, shaken together, and overflows out of us? Abundant life, resurrection life, everlasting life. So it says, For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge, or we thus distinguish, or we thus decide, or we thus think, that if one died for all, then we're all dead. And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. If you're just giving back to somebody what they give you, you're, you really you're living for yourself. You're not living for them, and you're not living for God. Because how do we live for God? How do we love God? By loving one another. Jesus says, whatever you've done to the least of them, you've done unto me. So again, what we understand is, when he talks about, he says, uh, we henceforth live, uh, he says, and that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. How do we live unto God? By living for one another. Not by giving back what we've gotten from one another, but by sharing what we've received from the Father. By receiving and releasing his love. That's how we don't live for ourselves, but live unto him. In verse 16 it says, Wherefore, henceforth, now we know no man after the flesh. Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Which is exactly what Jesus said. He said, judge not according to appearance. Paul said, know no man after the flesh. Don't look at the outside of people. Don't look at the actions of people. Don't look at the human effort or the flesh of people. Don't look at what people are doing to you. Look at who people really are. Judge righteous judgment. Don't look at people. Look in people. And see what's in there. See the hidden man of the heart. Understand that God loves you no matter what. That God loves everybody no matter what. That, that it, it, it's not conditional. It, God does not love according to what you just did. And, and God doesn't love according to what you're going to do. He just loves. And in that same way, when we know no man after the flesh, if, if, if I'm not concerned with your actions, if your actions don't define you to me, then I can love you no matter what. I can love you if you're mean to me. I can love you if you're nice to me. It doesn't matter. Because, again, it's not a conditional love. It's a love that flows from being loved. So he says, therefore, and I love this, this is how, this is how we know no man after the flesh. This is how we judge that if one died for all, then all died. He says, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. So if you're looking at the outside, if you're looking at the actions, you're looking at an old man who is dead. You're looking at a rotting corpse that may not know that it's dead, but it died 2,000 years ago. And if you're judging a dead man by their actions, then guess what? That's not going to help them, and it's not going to help you. But if you know no man after the flesh, but if you see a new creature, again, even if they don't know they're a new creature, okay, just because Jesus gave this gift of his own life to everybody doesn't mean everybody's received it. It doesn't mean everybody knows it. Most people are under the mistaken impression that they're sinners. And, and when I say most people, I mean most church people. Because, you know, people who aren't in the church, they don't care. They don't care about being labeled as sinners. They don't care about this Jesus stuff. All they know is that they want to be loved. And, and again, how, do, how, how, does, how does God loving us and, 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 and humanity not knowing that they're loved, where does that come together? Where does that meet? It meets in the Holy Spirit. It meets with you showing them that they are loved by loving them. It means don't judge them according to appearance. Don't know them after the flesh. But judge righteous judgment. Behold, all things are new. See somebody doing something wrong and don't call them out on it, but help them out of it. See, again, that's the mindset shift. That's thinking differently. That's judging differently. So again, it's not don't judge. It's, it's judge correctly. It's judge righteously. Don't judge according by what you see, but judge according to the Spirit. So he says... And I love this too. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God. Not some things, not good things. All things are of God. So how can we judge something to be ungodly when all things are of God? So again, I'm saying, what I'm saying is, we need to see God in every situation. We need to see God in every person. We need to see God in everything because all things are of God. 
God created everything. The Bible even says that God created evil. So what we need to understand is we're not judging things good and evil. We're not judging things nice and mean. We're not judging things according to appearance. We're not judging things according to the flesh. We're simply judging things of, okay, look, if you think you're in the dark, here's what I'm going to do. I'm not going to judge you. I'm not going to put you down. I'm not going to, uh, here's what I'm going to do. If you're judging things and you're in the dark, I'm going to shine some light. And then you won't be in the dark anymore. Then you won't be stumbling around anymore. Then you'll know some things that are true. And when you know some things that are true, then you can start to manifest that truth. Then you can start to believe that truth. Because that's how it works in the Bible. We know and believe the love of Christ. You can't believe something you don't know. But once you know the love of Christ, when, when, once, okay, first it gets into the head. The Bible talks about first it's in the natural, then it's in the spiritual. First you know it in the head, and then you believe it in the heart. But you got to see it to believe it. You know, I think Christians get a bad rap because they're always judging things negatively. They're always judging things against. I think in the, in, in the church world it seems like we're not for anything, but we're against everything. And really what we need to do is we need to start showing people what we are for. And, and, and what are we for? Love. So if we can start showing people love, then they'll stop seeing something in, in us that they don't like. Because listen, if, 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 if people think Christians are judgmental, they're not going to listen to us. They're just not. They're going to say, why are you railing on me about this when you're doing the same thing that I am? And, and, and that's not how it works. I do, I do not believe evangelism works by, you know, turn or burn. I do not believe evangelism works by the fear of an angry God. I believe evangelism works by, you want something and I know you want something. And I have it, so I'm going to share it with you. And then when you see it, when you experience it, then you can begin to believe it. Then, once you know what is available... Rather than looking for love in all the wrong places, you'll come to the source. Rather than running from who you perceive to be an angry God, you'll run to the open arms of a loving Heavenly Father. And I believe that that's what's going to bring people. Again, it's the goodness of God that leads and draws to repentance. So he says, All things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. So again, you know, I preached on this not too long ago, but I'm going to hit it here again. What's our job as ministers? Not, not, not even to reconcile people to God, because He already reconciled people to Himself, but just simply to take the ministry of reconciliation to tell people that they are reconciled. Not come get reconciled or else you're in trouble, but rather look what's available. God reconciled you to Himself. Not God will love you if you do this, this, and this, but just simply God loves you. And again, I think the best way to say that God loves you is really just to say, I love you. And when you can say, I love you to somebody, if you can connect with somebody, if you can fill them up with what it is that they're longing for, then you have an opportunity to really be able to show them something. I think people don't care what you say unless they know that you care about them. Okay, so 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 I, I'm, I'm convinced. I, when I talk to people, I don't throw Bible verses at them. What I try to do is I try to throw love at them. Because, again, that's how I feel. That my daddy loves me, so I'm going to love you. So that's, to me, the ministry of reconciliation. Not saying, come get reconciled or else, but saying, look what Jesus did. He reconciled you. Not saying, God will love you if you say the right words, but saying, God loves you. And then when you know God loves you, the right words start to come all by themselves. He says, to wit... That God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. So again, reconciliation is not saying, you're a sinner and you better stop. Reconciliation is saying, God's not imputing your trespasses to you. God's not mad at you. That's what reconciliation is. That's what the ministry of reconciliation is. It's not saying, stop sinning. It's saying, Daddy loves you. And if we can get people to really know and believe that Daddy loves them, all this other stuff takes care of itself. The Holy Spirit. Remember what we saw at the beginning of this? The love of Christ constraineth us. Okay, where does godliness come from? Not from us trying to act godly so that God will accept us. Godliness comes from God being Himself in us. And then that coming out of us naturally. So he says in verse 20, now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, which again to me simply means taking the love we've been given and sharing it with the world. 
proclaiming his name, not by saying Jesus or else, but by saying, I love you. Okay, I don't, I, I don't need somebody to say, okay, I accept Jesus. What I want somebody to say is, you love me? Okay, now we're getting somewhere. Because that's where the connection is made. The connection is not made by you saying, I accept Jesus, I believe. The connection is made by me saying, I love you, and you saying, wow, somebody loves me. I found what I was looking for. Because that's what people are looking for. People are not looking for religion. People are looking for relationship. They're looking for connection. They're looking for people to stop judging against them and start judging for them. And again, that's the ministry we've been given, the ministry of reconciliation. So he says, Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So again, Jesus says, judge righteous judgment. We are that righteous judgment. Jesus living his life in and through us, that's the judgment of God. It's not us trying to live his life. Because no one can live Jesus' life except Jesus. It's his life. If you're trying to be somebody else, then you're missing out on being yourself. And God wants you to be yourself. He just wants you to know who you really are. That's why I, I, I don't really very often get mad, but sometimes religion gets me mad when people say God loves you just the way you are. He just loves you too much to leave you that way. To me, that's crazy. To me, that doesn't make any sense. Either he loves me just the way I am, or he wants to change me. To me, that's mutually exclusive. You can't love me just the way I am and love me too much to leave me that way. Here's the truth of the matter. God loves you just the way you are. What he wants is for you to know the real way that you are. What he wants you to do is see the circumcision that was made without hands, to see that the flesh has been cut off of your stony heart and revealed his heart in your chest. What he wants you to do is know who you really are. And the way we know who he who the way we know who we really are is by knowing who he really is. When we look in the mirror with an unveiled face and we see the glory of God, that's when we're changed into that same image from glory to glory. It's not when we try really hard to be different. It's when we just simply look at Jesus. Because what we behold is what we become. So when we stop knowing by the flesh, when we stop judging according to appearance, that's when we begin to judge righteously. That's when we begin to judge correctly. That's when we begin to see that it's not about me versus you. It's about me helping you. So let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and this is where I want to close tonight. And again, I, I think a lot of this is really kind of uh, going to move into next week when we talk about uh, even, even more than judging is executing judgment. But we're going to look at that. I think we're going to look at that next week. So 1 Corinthians chapter 2, I want to read verses 12 through 16. And in the King James it reads, Now we have received... Not now we need to receive, not someday we are going to receive. Now we have received, not the spirit of this world, but the spirit which is of God. There was a transformation that took place 2,000 years ago when we were translated out of the power of darkness and into the kingdom of God's dear Son. That happened. So again, what we saw in uh, 2 Corinthians, all things are new. We have not received the Spirit of the world, but we have received the Spirit which is of God. That's a done deal. That doesn't need to happen. That's what allows us to do all of these things. That's what equips and empowers us to know and believe the love of Christ. The Holy Spirit is our love receptor. Without the Holy Spirit, Adam tried to earn God's love because he, he couldn't believe in his mind. He couldn't believe that God would love a sinner like him. He thought, man, I disobeyed God and now God's mad at me. When in fact, that, that, that was the furthest thing from the truth. God, I think God was sad because Adam didn't trust him, because Adam chose to believe the lies of the serpent. But I think that, you know, the Bible bears this out. God was still with Adam every single step of the way. Adam hid from the presence of God, but the presence was still there. Okay, so the Holy Spirit it allows us to enjoy that presence. It allows us to know and believe the love that the Father has for us. And that's what we've been given. And it says, now we have received... Not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God. That we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. See, I just started a rant series today where I'm talking about hiding and seeking and, 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 and you know, verses like, seek ye first the kingdom. 
But here's the deal. We're not seeking to get something that we don't have. Because we already have it all. We're seeking to understand what we have. We're seeking through the Spirit that we might know the things that are freely given. Because, you know, again, in different places, the Bible says you have, uh, you have an unction from the Holy Spirit and you know all things. Okay, so we don't need to know anything else. But then it also says the Holy Spirit leads and guides us into all truth. So it's not always about knowing, it's about understanding what we know. It's not about getting something, but it's about knowing and understanding and receiving and enjoying what we have. Because we don't need anything else. God gave us everything when He gave us His Son, when He gave us Himself, when He gave us His love, when He gave us His Spirit so that we could know the height and the depth and the breadth and the width of His love. He's equipped and empowered us to love by giving us the Holy Spirit, which leads and guides us into all truth, which, to me, all truth is the Father loveth the Son and has given all things into His hands. If you know Daddy loves you, you know everything. But it's so big that the whole Christian journey, it's not about knowing anything else, it's about really knowing, not with a head knowledge, but a heart knowledge, really knowing what it is that you know. It's about... Uh, knowing the things that are freely given to us of God. He says in verse 13, Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. So what's this righteous judgment? What's this knowing no man uh, after the flesh? It's spiritual things knowing spiritual things. It's deep calling out to deep. It's the Jesus in me connecting to the Jesus in you. Whether you know he's in there or not, whether you act like he's in there or not, it doesn't matter. Because again, we're not going spiritual to natural. We have not received the spirit of this world. But the spirit which is of God, which allows us to have that connection of love. It says in verse 14, But the natural man receiveth not the things of the spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. This is one of the reasons... And it talks about it in another place about how uh, the carnal mind, I believe it says the carnal mind is, uh, is at enmity with God. It's not subject to God's laws, nor can it be. This is why shoving scriptures down somebody's throat is never going to work. All that's going to do is make them choke. Okay, you cannot convince somebody uh, with, with, with words on a page. The only way you can convince somebody that God loves them is by showing them that love, by giving them that love. That's how you're convinced of something, by experiencing it. And the only way that, that an unbeliever can experience the love of God is if somebody who knows the love of God loves them. That's how this thing works. Daddy loves me, so I love you. And I don't care who you are, and I don't care what you're doing. I don't care if you want to be loved. And I don't care if you know that you want to be loved. I believe everybody wants to be loved. I don't care if you're happy about it. I'm just going to love you. Because that's why I'm here. That's the ministry of reconciliation. That's my divine epic purpose on this earth. That's my eternal purpose in Christ, is to be loved and to love with that love. Okay, so so again, uh, verse 15, it says, But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. So again, it, this idea of, well, you're a Christian, you're not supposed to judge, that's, that's not scriptural. That's, that's somebody with a guilty conscience telling you, you know, don't, don't point at me, don't look at me. Sometimes Logan will always say, don't look at me. It's a, it's a funny thing. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things. Jesus says, judge righteous judgment. So again, it's not about not judging, because what is judging? To the word judge again, it means distinguish, decide, or think. Jesus was not saying, don't think. He was saying, think correctly, think properly, think uh, righteously, which again is what we see in verse 16, which is which really wraps this back up with the thinking part. Verse 16 of 1 Corinthians 2 says, For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Jesus wasn't saying don't think, he was saying think with the mind of Christ. He wasn't saying don't think, he was saying, don't think like an old man, think like a new man. He wasn't saying, don't think. He was saying, don't think good and evil, think life. He was showing us the correct way to live this life. He was showing us what the Spirit does inside of us. 
The Spirit doesn't judge by appearance. The, the, the Spirit isn't worried about the outside. I forget which prophet it was, and I think John picks this up in Revelation 2, when they were told to, to, to measure the temple, they left out the outer court. They didn't judge the outer court. They didn't measure the outer court. They didn't know the outer man and, and, and his flaws and his mistakes and his actions. What they judged, what they measured, was the inside. And again, who's inside the temple? Jesus. How do we judge each other? Jesus. Jesus in me, Jesus in you. That's our judgment. That's who we are. And that's, again, that's how we connect. That, that's how we know no man after the flesh. It's by using the mind of Christ. By letting this mind of Christ that is already in us, be in us. And that doesn't mean try to think God's thoughts. That means God's thinking His thoughts in you. Just let it be. That means don't try to love because you think it'll, you'll get something out of it. That means God loves you. So now you can love naturally. Our new nature is a love nature. It's the Jesus nature. It, it, again, it's not, you hit me, I'm going to hit you back. It's if you hit me, okay, I'm going to take it. I'm going to accept it. And, and I'm not saying let people walk all over you, but I'm saying love people no matter what. Love people no matter who. Love people no matter where. Every situation that you will ever find yourself in, it needs love. And if you're there, it has love. Because that's what we have, because that's who we are. So let me hit this in the message, and then I'm going to close. I'm going to back up to verse 10 of 1 Corinthians 2 in the Message Bible. It says, The Spirit, not content to flit around on the surface, dives into the depths of God and brings out what God planned all along. Whoever knows what you're thinking and planning except you yourself? The same with God. Except that he only know except that he not only knows what he's thinking, but he lets us in on it. God offers a full report on the gifts of life and salvation that he is giving us. We don't have to rely on the world's guesses and opinions. We didn't learn this by reading books or going to school. We learned it from God, who taught us person to person through Jesus, and we're passing it on to you in the same first hand personal way. See, sometimes we try to make God so hard and so difficult. Like, oh, he's so distant. His ways are so much higher than ours. No, he's not distant. He's in here. He's inside of us. He lives in you. And, 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 and again, with my rant series, what I'm trying to talk about is the harder you try to find something, the more you're going to miss out on what you've already got. So again, it's not about us seeking. It's about Jesus revealing himself. And if you'll just listen, I believe the Spirit is always speaking. And if we'll just be quiet and listen to it, I think he'll tell us everything that we need. That's what he, he says here again in the Message Bible, talking about, uh, it says, God offers a full report on the gifts of life and salvation that he is giving us. He's not giving us a gift and then saying, oh, okay, figure it out, good luck. He's leading and guiding us into all truth. He's saying, here's my life, but, but listen, you don't have to live it, I'm going to live it. I'm going to give you my life, and I'm going to live my life in and through you. You don't even have to try to live Jesus' life, which, as I just said, is impossible. Only Jesus can live his own life, and, and, and he's chosen to live it in and through us. So he goes on in verses 14 through 16 and says, The unspiritual self, just as it is by nature, can't receive the gifts of God's Spirit. There's no capacity for them. They seem like so much silliness. And again, that's how, you know, that's, that's how most people look at church people. Like, look at these lunatics. Look at these, uh, what do you call them, granola Christians? Fruits, flakes, and nuts. Look at these weirdos. What are they doing? What are they talking about? Why are they speaking in, in, in weird sounds like that? Because it doesn't make sense. Except to the Spirit. The Spirit speaks to the Spirit. The deep calls out to the deep. It's not, a, you know, again, in Revelation, Jesus talks about, giving you a white stone with a name written on it, and nobody knows the name written on it until they receive it. And I believe there's only one name written on, the, uh, on one white stone, and I believe that name is Jesus. But you can't, you, you don't know that name until you receive it. It doesn't make sense until you get it. And again, how do you get it if somebody gives it to you? Because it's a gift. So he says, uh, Spirit can be known only by spirit. God's Spirit and our spirits in open communion. Spiritually alive, we have access to everything God's Spirit is doing and can't be judged by unspiritual critics. 
Isaiah's question, is there anyone around who knows God's Spirit, anyone who knows what He is doing, has been answered. Christ knows, and we have Christ's Spirit. So again, when we're talking about thinking or deciding or distinguishing or judging, it's not about don't judge. And it's not about being afraid of being judged. Because I think, again, this will go in, in more into next week's or, or possibly the week after that. But one of my favorite verses in the Bible talks about having boldness on the day of judgment. Because as He is, so are we in this world. Okay, Jesus was already judged by the Father. And the judgment was for Him. And the judgment was an everlasting, eternal, abundant, resurrection life sentence. See, He gave His life and then God raised Him back up. He said, here's the judgment. Not that you've died. That was a sacrifice. That freed people from sin. Okay, but now that you've made that sacrifice... First comes death, then comes the judgment. Here's the judgment, life. Here's the judgment, love. Here's the judgment, the kingdom. Here's the judgment, my spirit. And now because we have been given all things, those things, because the judgment was for us and not against us, now we can begin to think about things or judge things correctly, righteously, with the mind or spirit of Christ. Now when we look at a situation, we can see what it needs, which is love, and we can give it what it needs, which is love, because that's what we have. Because that's who we are. Because that's who Christ is in us. Uh, that's what I have for this week. Thank you. I love you. Next week, probably, we're going to talk about executing judgment. Amen.